Well, let me talk to you a bit about what's going on. A very important phenomenon that took place here in, uh, in 2013 when we joined 48 other states in privatizing the health care services to the lower income strata of our citizens. Uh, we were one of only two states at the time where the state was running this. And what happened was there were some partnerships that were formed, about eight partnerships across the state. You can kind of see what these partnerships were. And the one we're going to focus on today is University Health, which um, took the, uh, the uh, BRF uh, took uh, control over the, the hospital here and the one in Monroe. One of the things I wanted to point out is over here on the side, I have the dates in which this transition took place from publicly run to privately run. And the reason that's important is because you're going to be, you'll see that most of this transition took place in the latter half of 2013. Now that's kind of important because you're going to see some numbers that show pretty low numbers for 2013. The primary reason for that is most of the privatization effort took place uh, after 2030. Matter of fact, it was after 2013 before it was fully uh, in place. Now, one of the things that happened as a result of this effort, this transformation, this transition, if you like, was a, a lot of money suddenly started coming in to the state budget that was not coming in there before. And that money came basically from three sources. One of those sources was that under some of the agreements, the state retained control of some of the physical facilities they were operating before, but they received lease payments from the transition partners uh, in return for that. So this is money that suddenly started coming into the state treasury that was not coming in before. But really importantly, under the strange rules of the federal government, these lease payments became eligible for what we call the FMAP, the Federal Medical Assistance Percentage. They got a match. As a matter of fact, the match was even more than the lease payments were. And to give you an idea of how much money started flowing into the Treasury, look at these charts. This shows you the total amount of money that came in from the lease payments and the FMAP. As you can see, it started out low in 2013, again, because 2013, most of the privatization effort had not taken place. But the time you get to 2016, there was half a billion dollars plus of money flowing into the state budget that was not flowing into it before this privatization effort took place. Then, under the peculiar rules of the federal government, payments made now to physicians was eligible for this FMAP match too, which turns out again to be a number that was even greater than the physician payments. And to give you an idea of how big this was, you can see here starting out very low in 2013 because the privatization effort had not taken place. By the time the privatization effort was fully in place, there was a third of a billion dollars flowing into the state budget that was not flowing in there before because of the privatization effort. And then there was a third thing that helped out, and that is that there was, a, was helped out the state budget for sure, and that is a lot of these facilities were deteriorating, they needed all kinds of capital equipment spending done, and the state was going to have to take that out of the budget to spend. Well, as it turns out, as a result of the privatization effort, this was done by the private partners. And so this money did not have to come out of the state budget. And if you look at that, now this is the smallest of the numbers. Again, small in 2013, but by the time you get to 14, 15, and 16, privatization effort fully in place, you're talking about another $45 million or so flowing into the state budget. So if you sum all these together, and look at the total amount of new monies coming in as a result of the transition. By the time you get to 2016, there was almost a billion dollars flowing into the state budget as a result of the privatization effort. Now we're all, everybody in this room is aware of what's going on down in the Baton Rouge right now. We've got a state budget problem, we've got a deficit issue we're having to struggle with. Think for just a moment of how big, how much bigger that problem would have been if these monies had not been flowing into the state budget. This is a lot of money. If you sum this up across these four years, <clears throat> it adds up to almost $2.7 billion. So we would have had a much more difficult problem down in Baton Rouge with solving this budget problem if it had not been for this privatization effort. So a lot of money flowing in. Now what's kind of interesting is if you look at your area here, this is what we call the, the uh, University Healthcare Region. There's 21 uh, parishes here that are serviced by these, uh, by these two hospitals. Uh, one, of the th one of the interesting things to look at is how much of this $2.7 billion came out of your region. And if you look at the numbers, here's what they show. 
Over here, you have the total amount that came from these three sources. Here's the leases, position, FMAP, and the capital expenditure. Again, you add those up, they come up to about 2.7 billion. This is how much came out of your region here. And as it turns out, remarkably, 34% of that $2.7 billion came out of these 21 parishes, came out of this hospital area. Now that's very large, that's way bigger than any other region. Any other, remember I listed eight partners? This is way bigger than any of the other ones. And the primary reason for that is this number right here, the, uh, the one for physician FMAP. The, yours is a teaching hospital, so there were a lot of doctors that became eligible for that FMAP. And the only other area that came even close to y'all in this was New Orleans, which also has a teaching hospital, right? But the New Orleans number here is 26% lower than y'all. So you, you are responsible for a great deal of that money flowing into the state budget as a result of the privatization effort. So here's the next key question, though. The key question is, how much of that money came back to you folks? Okay? Well, that's what we want to ask next. And that's the, how much did your economy benefit from these monies going into the state budget and then being spent back here? Now, the tough thing with that is that we don't have precise numbers from the state about how much of it came back to you. This money just flowed into the state general fund and then it, some of it came back here. The question is, how did it come back here? And so what we tried to do was to estimate as best we could how much of that money came back. And here's what we assumed. We assumed because this $2.7 billion flowed into the state budget, the state budget didn't have to be cut by that much. If that money had not flowed into the state budget, the state would have had to cut. Where would they have cut? Well, you know there's only two places they can cut. Everything else is constitutionally protected. There's two places they could cut. One is in higher education and one is in health care. So um, what we did is we took those lease payments and the physician F maps and we said that money flowed into the state. How much of it flowed back here? Well, we said it was based on how much the state presently spends on higher education and health care in your region compared to the rest of the state. And so we have data from the legislative fiscal office. This is kind of the tricky part on uh, you know, what your share is of higher education spending and what your share is of healthcare spending. And so what we did was we took that money and we said, okay, we're gonna split that money 50-50 between spending it on healthcare and spending it on higher ed in your area. We're gonna allocate that money back to you. And when you do, then what we're gonna do is the capital expenditures, well, that's a little tricky here, but the third category, the capital expenditures, we know that was spent here. So there was capital money that was spent here that would not have spent otherwise, been spent here otherwise, uh, aside from that. So when you put this together, if all the money had been spent on health care, we estimate that about 549 uh, million would have come back here. If all of it had been spent on uh, higher education, about 630 million would have come back here. But we think the more realistic case is it was probably would have been split about 50-50. And if that's the case, there was about five, think about this for a minute, there was about $590 million that came flowing back to your region from the state budget that would not have flowed back here if this privatization effort had not taken place. And then you take that number, that 589, you add in the capital expenditures, which is about 50, uh, 58, uh, 58 million, you end up with 600, almost 650 million bucks that came back to this 21 parish region that would not have come if this privatization effort <clears throat> had not taken place. So if you think about this 21 parish area as a big old economic pond, this rock worth $650 million, two thirds of a billion bucks came flow, was dropped into your pond. But when it was dropped into that pond, that's not the total impact on your area because when that rock hit the pond, that money was spent on higher education and healthcare here. The people in those sectors earned money which they then turned around and spent it. Movie theaters, car dealerships, insurance companies, et cetera. There is a ripple effect, a multiple economists call a multiplier effect of that spending. So what we did, we had a table built, an input output table built of this 21 parish area 
and we plug that 648 million bucks into that table so we can see the total impact of that new spending. And here's what the numbers show. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus, I'm sorry if you're, this is, this is you're not gonna show up on the bottom very well, but if you look over this four year time period, the input output table suggests that there is over a billion dollars worth of new sales at firms in this 21 parish area that would not have occurred if this privatization ever not, had not taken place. There's about $400 million in new household earnings that were created in this 21 parish area over that four year period that would not have been created had this privatization not happened. There are about 2,818 jobs on the average over this four year time period that would, have been that would not have been created without this privatization effort. And about $18 million in new taxes for local governments that would not have occurred uh, without the privatization effort. So those are big numbers because big monies flowed into the state budget and then flowed back here. Now, again, if you just look at the latest year, just look on a yearly basis, look at 2016. 2016, according to the table, over a third of a billion dollars in new sales in 2016 occurred at firms in this 21 parish area. $136 million in new household earnings. 3,785 <coughs> new jobs supported. $6 million in new local government income. I want you to think about this for a moment. If the governor flew in on a helicopter here and announced, we had a new firm coming to the North Louisiana region. It was gonna create a third of a billion dollars in sales, $136 million in new household earnings, 3,785 new jobs, I promise you, that's gonna be on the front page, above the fold of the newspaper. This is big, this is very, very important. To give you an idea how important it is, 136 million is about the total personal income of everybody in Caldwell Parish. This number here, 3,785 jobs, that's about equal to the total number of people employed in Caldwell Parish. Basically what happened as a result of this privatization effort, it was like taking a whole new Caldwell Parish income and, and economy and adding it to this area. So it is non-trivial. This, this was a very big deal from just an economic standpoint. But importantly, there are some other benefits that occurred just to the people in that lower income strata uh, in terms of how they received health care benefits. There were a lot of efficiency gains. Uh, we economists tend to talk about the efficiency in the government sector versus the efficiency in the private sector. The government sector is working with other people's money. The private sector is working with their own money. So they have a tendency to be more efficient. And sure enough, that's exactly what the numbers show. Let me just show you what happens if you're receiving health care. Uh, reduced patient referral queues went from 12,000 down to 1,200. Reduced MR wait times went from 60 days to two days. CT scan wait times went from 21 days to one day. Uh, if you look at the improved quality, they were able to obtain a three-year accreditation from the Joint Commission, restored a level one trauma center certification, achieved primary stroke center certification. There are a lot of capital improvements. We talked about that $58 million, a new cardiac catheterization lab, uh, additional operating room suites were added, a renovated main lobby, waiting rooms, and hospital grounds. Um, you had expanded specialty services. There were, many of this, the lower income strata would have to go to New Orleans to get some of these services in the past. Now they are available here. You had advanced cancer radiation treatment, uh, new treatments for heart failure, including the absorb stent and this, I know, uh, cyroabulation. You'd probably don't know what that is unless you have AFib like I do. And uh, that's something to correct the, the beating of your heart and make sure it beats in the right mode. A bone marrow uh, transplant program uh, there are other improvements. There were the transition to a more streamlined medical record system. And it's interesting when it's your money and not somebody else's money, what happens to your emphasis on collecting bills, okay? Billing collection were improved by 44%, and they had the initiation of some healthcare education initiatives that took place also. So if not only were these economic benefits, which are non-trivial, they're significant benefits, but also if you're a recipient of this health care. Now, there's been some major benefits to you from this privatization effort. So there was, there was a reason why 48 other states were doing it this way, okay? We were just late to come to the game, and when we came to the game, 
We started seeing why the 48 other states did it the way they did. There's some major benefits from that. So that gives you a quick review of what we, uh, of what we found. And let me see if you have, uh, if you have any questions.